Uh, this this is a Ron and Kelly joke. Uh, they they kind of been supplying me with jokes. This one's called uh, Pecans in the Cemetery. Are you ready? It says on the outskirts of a small town, there was a big old pecan tree just inside the cemetery fence. One day, two boys filled up a bucket full of nuts and sat down by the tree, out of sight, and began dividing the nuts. One for you, one for me, one for you, one for me, said one boy. Several dropped and rolled down toward the fence. Another boy came riding along on the road on his bicycle. As he passed, he thought he heard voices from inside the cemetery. He slowed down to investigate. Sure enough, he heard one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. He just knew what it was. He jumped back on his bike and rode off. Just around the bend, he met an old man with a cane hobbling along. Come here quick, said the boy. You won't believe what I heard. Satan and the Lord are down at the cemetery dividing up the souls. The man said, beat it, kid. Can't you see it's hard for me to walk? When the boy insisted, though, the man hobbled slowly to the cemetery. Standing by the fence, they heard, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. The old man whispered, boy, you've been telling me the truth. Let's see if we can see the Lord. Shaking with fear, they peered through the fence, yet were still unable to see anything. The old man and the boy gripped the, the wrought iron gates or bars of the fence tighter and tighter as they tried to get a glimpse of the Lord. At last they heard, one for you, one for me. That's all. Now let's go now let's go get those nuts by the fence and we'll be done. <laughs> they say the old man had to leave for a good half mile before the kid on his bike passed. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's funny, I don't care who you are. Amen. Praise the Lord of glory. Excited about Jesus. Amen. Amen. I just entitled this message, Stop Trying to Be Who You Are. Stop trying to be who you are. And, 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 I, and I say say all that to say, first of all, let me say this, you must be born again. Now, if you're not born again, you're a child of the devil. It's quiet in here. <laughs> you know, you must be born again. And once you're born again, you change, you are translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. But so many Christians today are trying to be who they already are. That's why yesterday, and, and we're very sensitive to lyrics, I told you that. Walt Carroll did a great job, right? But it's, I'm not going to shout. I'm shouting right now. I'm not going to be happy. I'm happy right now. Amen. Amen. See, the enemy doesn't care where you relegate the finished work of Christ, if it's to the past or if it's to the future, just so it isn't in the now. Think about that. Well, it was great back in the days. Oh, God, I'll tell you what, the good old days. Well, was it? I tell people all the time, these are the good old days. You're in right now. Hallelujah. You can look back at this time and say, man, wasn't it great then? Oh, man, it's great all the time because Jesus Christ lives in you. You're born again. And he also, the enemy also doesn't care uh, if you relegate everything to the future. He likes that too because then it's, once again, it's not in the now. See, I tell people all the time, Jesus Christ is not my coming king. He's my king right now. I'm not going to be a Christian. I'm not going to be in the kingdom. I'm in the kingdom right now. Well, we got to get that because it's so subtle and it just relegates it to, well, someday, uh, you know, when I'm caught up, I'll have a cabin down by the lake and all that stuff. Guess what? I'm caught up right now. Amen. I have to see you standing right there. Physically, I'm right here. But how do you mean you know the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, that you have been raised up, that means now, and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ. That's not future. That's right now. Amen. Because I've been seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's my position. Amen. Well, we got to get that. Amen. Hallelujah. Your word, faith, kingdom. Now, I'm all those things. I'm, I'm gospel. <laughs> See, a lot of people say they're preaching the gospel, but you know what makes the gospel the gospel? It, number one, gospel is good news because it's about somebody who did everything perfect on your behalf. That's why it's good news. Do you know you're perfect? Yes. We, uh, you're perfect. Can I show it to you? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Look at this verse. We can start here in a minute. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at this. For by one offering, this is referring to what Jesus did at the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection. For by one offering, he's going to perfect. He what? He hath perfected forever. Think about that. Forever. No, no, you. you this is going to encourage people. All oh, there, you know, we've been accused of being once saved, always, all these different things. If you're born, you don't lose your salvation like you lose your car keys. Amen. Hallelujah. 
It's based on him and not you. You know why Christians sin? They don't know who they are. Hallelujah. That's what we say all the time. You're in better shape than anybody's ever told you if you're born again. You're in as good a shape as Jesus. Now, I'm not saying there's not problems in the physical realm. But I'm saying that in the spirit, he that is joined of the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. As he is, 1 John 4, 17. So are you in this world. Not going to be. You already are. Boy, it's quiet. This is the gospel. This is why it's good news. You know what a procrastinator is? We've said it. It's someone who won't take now for an answer. Hallelujah. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are, that's you and me, if you're born again, sanctified, set apart. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's good news, is it not? But then why is we have this such a glorious position in Christ, which we do, why is it, does it seem like so few really walk in it? Once again, they don't know. One of the dumbest things I've ever heard, and I used to think it was a good thing, well, it don't matter where you go to church. I used to think that was, well, because I know what I, when I said it, I know what I meant by it. It doesn't matter what the name is or all that, but it matters what people are sharing. It matters if you're hearing New Covenant or a mixture of New Covenant and Old Covenant. See, it's difficult to see mixture because there's true things in mixture. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, I got a lot to say. <laughs> All right. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. I got a bunch of verses here, as usual. We're gonna, I'm going to review a little bit from last week so you can understand. Uh, uh, we're going to take a few things, that, a couple things I didn't cover from last week. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, please. Okay. So powerful. Chris. 1 John 4, verse 10. What's that? We're not recording now. Either. Oh, we're not recording yet? Oh, no, we were, cool. but it stopped. Okay. You want us to just continue or you want to try Just to try to keep continue however it needs to go. First John chapter 4, verse 10. We got, we got, sorry. That's all right. Are you going to still going to delete those? We're going to have this will be a new thing to scratch. To scratch, to scratch. Okay. We'll get it back on. You want to start up? Start up? Just start? Just continue. Just, okay. Just tell. We'll have to use our Bibles. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to use our Bibles. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that something? First John chapter 4. Verse 10. What does it say? Anybody know? Herein is love. Not that we love God. Did you catch that? Amen. This is the love that, the, that God's word talks about. Not that we love God. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the what? The propitiation for our sins. I, there's many definitions of toning sacrifice. All these different uh, mercy seed, all these different things for propitiation. But my favorite is he sent his son to be the satisfaction. Everybody say satisfaction. He, now watch this. I'm going to read it to you from the Amplified Bible. In this is, is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice, the satisfaction for our sins. So the love that God talks about is not my love for him, but his love for me. Now watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. I'm, not, I'm used to waiting for people to turn, but I'll, I'll try. But here's what it says. It's the love of Christ. Not love for Christ. It's the love of Christ. Not love for Christ. It's his love for me. Now watch it. It says it constrains me. It motivates me. It compels me. Look at the Amplified Bible. For, what did I say? 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry. Chapter 5 verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5.14. Listen to the Amplified Bible. For the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us. Because we are of the opinion and conviction that if one died for all, then all die. The love of Christ, not love for Christ, it controls. It urges and impels. Now think about this. If I'm not receiving the love of Christ, and it's all about my love for him, then what's controlling me? Are you hearing if I'm not receive, if I don't understand it's his love for me, then what is there to impel me, to control me, to constrain me, to move me? There has to be law. There has to be law. There has to be something I've got to. You know why the Bible says in Galatians 3:12 that the law is not of faith? You know, law, all law is is just any external rule that you put on people. It denies that anything has happened inside. You know that. 
But but all, but it, but it, but it, I need that. If there's nothing going on inside, I cannot take the law away from people because then I got to control people. See, this is what preachers do all the time. They try to control people, whether intentionally or unintentionally. I've decided we're going to rip all the law and self-righteousness off people so they can see clearly who they are in Christ. If you see who you are in Christ, you will be motivated. Amen. We got in a big discussion Thursday night on tithing, and I was so proud of the people in their conversation. I said, you know, really, a tenth or a fifth or a hundred, that's not the point. It's your motivation behind what you do. As you purpose in your heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or constraint. God loves a cheerful giver. That's new covenant giving. The way you want to do it. Oh, see, because if you think you're an old sinner saved by grace, then, well, you know, if you remove the law and people go nuts, it's because they wanted to go nuts all the time anyhow. I'm trying to calm down. It's hard. It's hard. But if you see who you are as he is, do you get that? As Jesus is, if you're born again, as Jesus is, so are you in this world Amen. right now. Amen. Glory to God. That's why I'm shouting right now. That's why I'm happy right now. That's why I'm excited right now. I'm not going to be. I already am. Oh, it's going to increase, and it has been increasing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to show you a few other things in 1 John chapter 4, verse chapter 4. I want uh, in verse 16. Watch this. And we have known the, and believed the love that God hath to us. The love of, that God cherishes for us, the Amplified Bible says. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. Herein is our love made perfect. That is a terrible translation. Sorry, King Jimmy. Herein is the love made perfect. Herein is him, the revelation of his love for me. It's not my love, it's his love. His love's been shed abroad in my hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto me. Here, watch this. Here it is. His love in me made perfect. Why? That I may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now watch this. Because, now watch this. The day of judgment is not futuristic. I'll say it again. Is there a judge? I'm not here. The day of judgment, Jesus judged you at the cross over 2,000 years ago. Your, his death was your death. You've already been judged if you're born again. Yeah. That's why you can have boldness in the day of judgment. Well, then what is the day of judgment, Chris? I'll show it to you. Look at it. The day of judgment is when anything tries to come upon you that Jesus has already been judged for, like depression, like sickness. Yeah. That's a day of judgment. It's trying to get on you, and Jesus has already been judged for it. That's why you can have boldness in the day of judgment when something tries to judge you for what Jesus has already been judged for. Watch this. Because as he is, so are you, so are we in this world. Amen. If it's referring to a future judgment, why does he start talking about being bold as he is in this world? Why is it this world? Amen. Oh, are you getting this? You know why our young kids aren't interested in Jesus? Ours are in Jesus' name. You know why they're not? Well, that's something for when you get old and you're about ready to die. Can I be honest? Can I be honest? When you're young, I got life to live. I used to think that. I remember being in the bars thinking, someday I'm going to be religious. Because <laughs> that's all I knew about God. But not now. I got things to take care of. Boy, I took care of them all right. Messed up big time. Amen. <laughs> someday, when I get older and I'm ready to die, I'll call out to the dawn. What a lie. What a lie. See, this, see you can, you're, the love of Christ is made perfect in you. You can have boldness when anything tries to come upon you that Jesus has already been judged for. I'm going to say something. You know it's not God's desire that you even have an accident? Amen. You don't think that makes you have an accident. See, we just don't know who we are. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm, I'm saying amen to that. <laughs> Watch this because, well, what if you do? Listen, I'm saying amen to that. He's by divine protection. He's by safety. He gives it. Listen, on Mount Zion, we've talked about this out of Hebrews chapter 12. What that means is if you're on the mountain of new covenant, there's a myriad of angels. Protection. Protection. But if you're on a mixture, if you're on Mount Sinai, guess what? There ain't any angels there. Watch this. As he is so you in this world. Next verse. There is no fear in love. How many have ever felt fear before? Me too. <laughs> there is no fear in love, but perfect love. Whose love is perfect? My love for him or his love for me? 
Hallelujah. Here, there is no fear in love, but his perfect love will cast out all fear. You know, I used to have when I'd have a bad thought or, or have, you know, areas in my life that I'd see, well, this needs to improve. I used to sit there and think, okay, I got to deal with this. I don't think like that so much anymore. You know what I think like? <sighs> Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now I've realized I've already done that when I, when I accepted him. And I realized that I put on Jesus and I make no provision for the flesh. The word provision, that's Romans 13, 14. The word provision means forethought. When you realize that you've put on Jesus, guess what? You're not shoveling the dark out of the room. You're not trying to patch the holes in the boat. It automatically dispels that stuff. Yeah. You know what darkness is? Darkness is caused by a covering, by a veil. I used to think darkness was just... You know, all the sins of the flesh and all that stuff. Really, darkness is just when you're veiled by an old covenant mentality. It causes darkness. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, it says in Proverbs 20, 27. When you're born again, your spirit's lit. Psalm 18, 28. You're, you're lit, baby. Say, look at my, I'm lit. <laughs> Hallelujah. But see, what veils that is, is the old covenant mentality. It veils that light, and that's why men love darkness. They love to think, man, I'm cool. I'm good. Without Jesus, I can handle it. I'm good. I got it. I don't need it. Hallelujah. He loves you so much. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has. Are you ready for this? Watch this. Torment. You know what the word torment? You know, it's used one other place in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, where Jesus, they separate the sheep and the goats. Some go into everlasting life and some into everlasting torment. That's the same word there for torment. That's the torment of fear. We've always applied that to hell, right? Pretty tormenting, right? <laughs> I think so. He that feareth is not, this is why he fears. He's not been perfected in the love of Christ for him. He doesn't know how much he's loved. And let me say this. It takes a divine revelation by the Holy Spirit to understand the love of God. Do you understand it all fully? No, I'm growing in it. I see all the time, man, that there's just so much, the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, of his love for me. Now you're able to ask whatever you will. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think because you understand the breadth, the length, the depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes finite human knowledge. Amen. One more verse, and then we'll. We love him, and some, the New American Standard and others, and some Greek interlators do not have him, you, but you could use him, but it just says we love. We love. We love. Why do we love? Because he first loved us. Now, if you don't understand that he first loved you, are you going to love? Amen. Thank you for that one. Yep. No. Or whatever it was. Thanks, Dale. <laughs> we love him. We love because he first loved us. That's how we love. Now, here it is. Here's how the Lord gave it to me, and I will give it to you this way. Are you ready? He said, he said, it's the three R's. It was a Saturday morning. I remember. I was driving on Eitzen Road. Heading out to the Sullenbargers, a bee guy. And I remember going out, and, I was, and he said, it's the three R's. And I thought, what are the three R's? The three R's are, we receive his love. That's his love for us. We return his love to him. That's worship. That's true worship. And then we release his love on other people. That's the fruit of the Spirit. He said, it's receive, return, release. I thought, you know, Lord, I can handle that. I can understand that. Now go to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5. I think that's what I want. Colossians 1, 5 and 6. Hallelujah. I think. Well, we'll figure it out. Back up to verse 4, please. Verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. Next verse. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. There it is, Chris. The hope's in heaven. Some glad morning, baby. And I'll be in my cabin by the lake. Walking on streets of gold. Oh, I got so much to say about that stuff. I'm going to say it again. Heaven is now, if you're born again. Amen. He's going to spend, <laughs> listen, he continues throughout the ages to come. I diminish nothing from that. In fact, I carry around the scriptures from Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 on down, where Paul said, I have a desire to depart with Christ, which is far better. So I totally believe all that. But I also know this, the way that the apostle Paul was able to, to be content in every situation, Philippians 4, 11, whether he was abounding or abasing, as he was tasting that heavenly realm that lived in him. Amen. I've been tasting it more and more. I'll be, I'll be driving my bus, and I'll just, I just taste that world. And I think, man, Lord, it, nothing else matters. 
It don't matter. Nothing matters. <laughs> Hallelujah. How could Paul be beaten, stoned, and left for dead, and all those things? And he said stuff like, I don't even count my life dear unto myself. Watch this. That I might finish my course with joy. You know why we, we struggle with joy? Because we're hanging on to who we think we are. <laughs> let, me tell, let me tell you who you are. We're going to get into identification. You are who he is. Christ in you is the only hope of glory. Who you are in Christ is who he is. You've become one with him. That's the new covenant. That's not blasphemy. That's the new covenant. Man, hallelujah. That's why you can walk around with confidence. <laughs> hallelujah. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, this does not mean, this just means that that's where it originates from. That's where it originates. We're coming right back here. Jump over to Galatians 5, verse 22. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 lists the fruit of the Spirit. Watch this. But the fruit of the Spirit, and it lists the nine attributes of the fruit singular. Now watch this. It's fruit from the Spirit. You got that? It's fruit from the Spirit. All it's saying is that's where the fruit comes from. It's not saying it just stays in the Spirit. Oh, somebody hear this. It's saying it originates from the Spirit. Paul said in Colossians, or Romans chapter 1, verse 9, he thanked God whom he served with his spirit. Does that mean what? Well, I'm just, I'm serving God with my spirit. I'm in the spirit. Leave me alone. You know, you study Mary and Martha, you check out the big offering that Mar or Mary, who was sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him, you check it out later, a couple of chapters later, about the huge offering that she gave. Jesus in the ministry. You check it out. You, you do some research on it. Grace will not cause you to be lazy. It will empower you. This is fruit from the Spirit. It's love that's in your spirit manifesting in your physical wall. You see that? It's joy that's in your spirit manifesting in your experience. It's peace that's in your spirit manifesting in your, your experience. See, but the church has said, no, 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 Chris. So you, We've made a work of the flesh out, out of the fruit of the Spirit. So people are going around trying to love people. How does love you? Love you. I read that thing. I need to love people and forgive them. I read, I read that book. I need to love people and forgive them. I don't though, but I need to. See, we think it's a feeling. It's not a feeling. It's what the Word says. It's what the Word says here. You know how I know I love you? The mirror that tells me I love you. Do you understand that? This is what God's Word says. Hallelujah. It's that simple. I don't have to feel like I love you. I know I love you. He told me that. He said, that's who you are. That's who I am. Thank you very much. But so it's fruit from the Spirit. Now go back to Colossians 1, 5. I have the bugger. I can see that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. In other words, that's where it originates from. Ephesians 1, verse 3 talks about you're blessed with all spiritual uh, blessings in heavenly places in Christ. It originates from that realm. Where have you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? Now, in Greek, this is a picture of the gospel being preached unpolluted or unadulterated by any contaminants such as mixture of what he did and what you do. Did you catch all that? Repeat it back. I'm kidding. Next verse. <laughs> Which has come unto you. As it is in all the world, and this is made available to the entire world. How many have said, well, we're going to preach the gospel to the world, then Jesus is going to come back. Can I tell you, we've already come to the world. Amen. Woo! Good. You know what that means? It doesn't mean there's not places that haven't heard. It means that the gospel's been made available to the entire world. That's what it means. Study it. Good. I have. <laughs> Why do we believe what we believe? Because that's what everybody tells us, and we never search it out. Glory to God. I thank God for honest Christians. I do. I thank God for people that aren't afraid to think outside the box, but they stay within the book. Amen. Which has come unto you as, as, as it is in all the world. That's what Paul said. I didn't say it. The Holy Spirit through Paul. And bringeth forth fruit as it doeth also in you. When does it bring forth fruit? When does it bring forth fruit? Since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. That's when it brings forth fruit. Since the day you heard of it and you knew the grace of God in its pure, 
unadulterated, uncontaminated, unpolluted form, it will automatically bring forth fruit. The linguistic key to the Greek New Testament, I believe that's what one of the references I looked at, it says the gospel, are you ready for this? In its pure unadulterated form is a reproducing organism. <laughs> Glory to God. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Because if we don't believe that, then, well, we, see, we, well, we got to be balanced, brother. You, you don't, you, you, you got to be balanced. See, a lot of what we call balance is mixture. I believe in correct biblical balance. We'll get to some of that. But you can't mix the covenants and call that balance. That's Babylonian, for those of you that have been here. Now jump over to uh, Colossians chapter 1. You're in chapter 1. Jump over to verse 9 and 10. Watch this. This is so good. It gets gooder and gooder. Colossians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, uh, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled. Well, here's what I'm after. That you might be filled. That you might be filled. That you might be filled. Watch this. With the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now watch this. Spiritual understanding. Well, there you go, Chris. That's only for preachers uh, who, who just get away and they're all into their spiritual understanding. Well, what does all of his wisdom being filled with it and spiritual understanding do? Next verse. That she might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. In other words, correct wisdom of God and spiritual understanding causes me to walk in the physical. Watch this. Worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Being fruitful in every good work. Whew. You know why we got to have revival? Those people don't know who they are. If you know who you are, you live in revival. If you want to use that word, sorry, Steve. <laughs> I have attitudes against words too, don't get me wrong. I do. Because of the way they've been abused. See, you live in a constant zeal and excitement for God when you get all the stuff that tells you you're not who he said you are out of the way. You stop trying to be who you are. You stop laboring to get into a room that you're already in. You stop postponing heaven till just when you die. Eternal life doesn't start when you die. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That, my friend, is eternal life. It starts now and continues through the ages to come. Amen. Yes. If you have all, you're filled with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You walk worthy of the Lord unto all, placing your fruitful in every good work. And notice what else you're doing. You're increasing. You're increasing. You're increasing in the knowledge of God. I say this all the time. Your greatest enemy is ignorance. I'll say that again. You're, you're and my and mine. Greatest enemy is ignorance. Jump over to 2 Peter. I'll just start with verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that are going to obtain, like, oh, did I mess that up? Have obtained, watch this, like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice whose righteousness it is. It's his. And we have obtained you're not going to get faith. You've already got faith. It is unscriptural for me to tell you as a New Testament believer to have faith. You've already got faith. Amen. <laughs> well, again, Jesus said, before the cross, he said that. Mark eleven twenty two. 22, have faith in God. Have the faith of God. I've heard it all. You've already got faith. You're born again. As he is, so are you in this world. You've already got everything you'll ever need. You're complete in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Amen. The living Bible says, if you have Jesus, you have everything. <laughs> Your only labor is just to believe it. Amen. Next verse. Watch this. This is what I'm after. Grace and peace. Now, do we have grace and peace? Yes. Absolutely. But notice what it says. They're multiplied unto you. You mean I can multiply his grace, his unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor, and his peace in my experience? And how do I do that? Unto you through the knowledge. Notice it doesn't say through more activity. It says, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Can I have this thing amplified? Watch this. This is good. May grace, God's favor. You know grace is God's favor? You know God's favor can be multiplied in your experience? Oh, glory. But I thought I already have it. You do positionally. But if you never increase in the knowledge of who he is and what he's done on your behalf and who you are in him, it won't multiply in your experience. This is why we've got to have revival meetings. <laughs> Excuse me, 
I hear some of that stuff and I'm, well, my brother so and so's going to have a revival meeting. We're going to have a celebration when Dr. Hiles is here. Amen. Anybody that comes here, we're going to celebrate who we are. We're going to guess we're going to learn, but we're going to continue to increase in the knowledge of him and what he's done on our behalf. But watch this. Man, God's favor, the creator of the universe's favor can be multiplied in my experience. I like that. Yeah. How many of you like that? Yeah. My hands up. <laughs> May God's favor and peace, which is perfect well-being. Yeah. Perfect well-being. Watch this. All necessary good. All spiritual prosperity. <clears throat> well, what about physical? Remember, it starts in the spirit. <laughs> and freedom from fears. Well, I'm liking this. <laughs> freedom from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts be multiplied to you individually in the full, personal, precise, and correct knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Oh! <laughs> good news. That's really, really good news. Now, let me let me keep that up there because I want to ask you a question. If, if grace and peace are multiplied unto me through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, notice it's Jesus our Lord, not our Savior. He is our Savior, but he's, if he's our Lord, he'll be your Savior. That's why it says if you confess him as Lord. That means you're renouncing self-trust to trust what he did. Amen. And if, he, if he's your Lord, he becomes your Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, I got Jesus as my Savior. Now I'm just going to, no, let him be your Lord. He loves you. He's not a dictator. He don't force anything on you. But if, if, if grace and peace are multiplied to you through the knowledge of, of him and who he is and what he's done. Now think about this. And you have a coin. You have heads. You have tails. You flip the coin. So that's one side of the coin. What would be the other side of the coin? Is it safe to say that his grace, which is already yours 100%, and his peace are, are lost in your experience if you don't know who you are and who he is? Would that be safe? Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. We'll just do the King Jimmy. Hebrews 2, 1. Watch this. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Here it is. Lest at any time, look at this, we should let them slip. So if grace and peace are multiplied unto you through understanding who he is and what he's done, it's safe to say that if we don't give heed to these things, they begin to slip. As D.O. Moody said, we leak in our understanding. Do you know, I was reading Kenyon the other day, and he was, or actually listened to an audio book, and he said, you could so soak in the word and so become one with, in your understanding of who you are in him, what he's done, one with the word. Like I said, what you put in, let me say it to you this way, what you give the majority of your time to is what you're feeding on. Well, it, I've said it a gazillion times, but if all I do is watch Roadrunner cartoons and go to pray for somebody, you know what's coming out. If all I do is watch Gilligan's Island, I like Gilligan's Island, and I go to pray for somebody, all it's going to come out is, yo, yo, buddy. <laughs> I tried to say it. You know? And it's not that God doesn't love me. It's not that I don't have this great position in Christ. This is why it's so much. See, all around us, there's voices. They're telling us, even within our own thinking. Religion runs deep, baby. Yeah. That's why, you know, I'm, I'm trying hard. <laughs> I, I'm, the book of Revelation, just, I'm just so excited about it. And we went into some things last week I want to review just a little and show you. God is trying to set you free. Number one, we're all squirreled up in religion. We have been. Nobody here. But if you'll come out of that and you'll think of things. I tell people this all the time. If you could show me in the Bible, in the Bible, not what your church says, not your opinion, not, not my opinion. In the Bible, say, show me where I'm missing it. I'll change. If you could show me in the Bible that the mark of the beast is a computer chip, I'm going with it, baby. But you know where I've read all that stuff? It hasn't been in the Bible. Come on. If it's not in the Bible, there's a reason why it's not in the Bible. Thank you for that thunder sight. <laughs> when you start comparing Scripture with Scripture, you begin to see it. Whew, boy, it's quiet here. I love it. <laughs> that means you're thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, you're ready to throw something. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, I'm just going to review just a little bit because I want to say something. I, I'll, I'll give you the Scriptures if, if you never heard it. I just want to show it to you in a couple other verses. 
Every person, before you're born again, you're united with Satan. You're one with him. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. Can I just have that quick? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. It doesn't say you were in the darkness. It says you were darkness. For ye were sometimes darkness. Notice it doesn't say you were in darkness. Even though you obviously were. It says you were darkness. It, said, it, it says, but now. Somebody say now. now. Are you light of the Lord and walk as children of the light? Notice what he's saying. He's saying... You're not what you used to be. <laughs> Somebody said, yeah, I know what you mean, brother. I can't quite take the snaps like I used to. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. You're not who you used to be. So what, what has happened before our conversion, we were programmed by a mode of thinking, by a, by a mindset, if you will. The Bible says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, Ephesians 4.23, the very depths of the way you think. Put on the mind of Christ, which you have. And it says, so you were like this. And so this, a lot of this thinking is still there. Okay? And that's what I, I like to refer to as the mark of the beast. See, and we talked about, how, where do you get that, Chris? Uh, I'm going to give you some other scriptures today. But I told you about Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 18, where it says, uh, God, uh, Solomon said, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they're beast. See, it means we're animal-like. We was in, in uh, Jude verse 19 last week. How many of you been in church for any length of time? How many of you have seen people operating pretty animalistic? If you've ever been on a board, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Not ours. <laughs> Are you hearing me? People can do you in and say, praise the Lord, brother, I love you. You know what that is? That's beastly characteristics. And the whole time they're telling me about my computer chip I don't want to take because I won't be able to buy bread if I do. Right? It's not in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that the beastly nature in people might not come up with something to try to control man. I don't know, and neither do you. But that's not the point. How does it apply to my life right now? See, this beastly mindset is something that only a revelation of Jesus Christ can get rid of. Only when that Jesus took all that, that he became you at the cross. So you could become him at the Father's right hand. Now watch this. For you were sometimes darkness, but now, I love that now. Now are you light in the Lord. Let me give you some other scriptures to just um, expand on this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 from the Amplified Bible. Colossians 3. The word for mark of the beast, and I never shared this last week, I want to share it. The word is kerygma in Greek, if I pronounced that right. And it means a badge of servitude. A badge of service. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 8, he that commits sin is literally the slave or the servant of sin. But do you know that because you're born again now, according to Romans chapter 6, you are a slave of righteousness? Yeah. Just like you were a slave of sin and you couldn't help it, of the sin and all the sins, the works of the flesh that come from that, just like you were, now you're enslaved to righteousness. You can't help yourself. <laughs> See, some of us like, I don't know about that. I think I can help it. You can't help yourself. You can't. <laughs> Some people will find it hard, but this is how powerful your new birth is. This is why we got to, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can by the grace of God to jerk every bit of law off of you. Every bit of that mindset that it says it's about your performance. See, your performance matters in the sense of you receiving what he did. See, it's those who are receiving the abundance of grace, present tense, and the gift, the gift, the gift of righteousness. Those are the ones who reign in this life by one Christ Jesus. So we have a receiving process. Just like Mary was sitting, the revelation right there, at the feet of Jesus, hearing his words. And Jesus said, oh, Martha says, don't you know that my sister has left me to do all this stuff? And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're busy and cumbered. Literally, the Greek says, drug about by all these worries and agitating passions. But one thing, one thing, look at your neighbor and say, one thing, one thing is needful. Mary has chosen that good part. It will not be taken away from her. If you don't do the one thing, you're going to be troubled about many things. It's the one thing. Sitting, a posture of rest at his feet and hearing him. Amen. But see, when you hear him, it'll motivate you in every other area. <laughs> I'm more motivated now than I've ever been. I do more things now than I've ever done. I'm busier now than I've ever been. But I feel more empowered. I don't feel burnt out because I'm burning in. Amen. Hallelujah. 
This is Colossians 3, 5. For the, let me back up. <laughs> this is so good. I'll just give you the first, basically, three or four verses of this. It says, in, leave that up there, please. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If you be risen with Christ, or if you be dead with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, verse 3. You are dead. Whew, I wonder what that's dead. <laughs> it's not your physical body that's dead. You are dead. That's your position. You died when he died. You are dead in Christ. And your life is him in Christ in God. When Christ is our life, who is our life, shall appear. Literally, it says manifest. When Christ, is, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. When you understand, when you see Christ manifesting in your life, you appear with him in glory. Now look. Because of this position, when you see yourself raised up and seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ, when you recognize that the old Chris is dead and this is a new creation, glory to God, look what happens. You kill. You deaden. You deprive of power. You deprive of power. Don't you love that? The evil desire working in your members. Look at this. Those animal impulses. I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men. That God might manifest them and that they might see that without the spirit of Christ, they're animals. <laughs> we operate survival of the fittest. Amen. Thanks for revelation. So dead, deprived of, I love that deprived of power. The evil desire lurking in your members, those animal impulses and all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin, sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, and holy desires, and all greed and covetousness, for that is idolatry. It's the deifying of self and other created things instead of God. Whoa. There, my friend, you're looking at beastly. You're looking at the mark of the beast. Amen? Hallelujah. Now jump over to 2 Peter chapter 2. Verses 10 through 12 from the Amplified Bible. A badge of servitude is what this mark is. 2 Peter chapter 2. Wow. Glory to God. This is so good. And, and those who walk after the flesh and indulge in the lust of polluting passion and scorn and despise authority, they're presumptuous and daring, self-willed and self-loving creatures. They scoff and revile digni dignitaries, glorious ones without trembling. Next verse. Whereas even angels, though superior in might and power, do not bring any fame and charge against them before the Lord. Here's what I'm after, verse 12. But these people, like unreasoning beasts, <laughs> these people who operate just based on their five senses. When we talk about not being sense-led, we're not against senses. God gave you the five senses. He just wants them trained to discern good and evil. He doesn't want them usurping authority over your spirit man, over who you are in Christ. He wants them to be subjugated to your spirit man. Amen. Yes. See, but when we're led by senses, this is why people are up and down. In and out. They're on fire, they're off fire. They're at this, they're up, they're down. Listen, you can live consistent. You know that? You've been raised up and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ. You're dead. Those old emotions can't control you. I feel like I'm... It's the Holy Ghost, man. I want to say something so powerful about his ministry. But these people are like unreasoning beasts, mere creatures of instinct. You know how many people say God told them to do something? It ain't no more God than the man in the moon. Why? Because it violates scripture. It's not what the Lord's saying. It doesn't exalt Jesus. It's not based on the more sure word of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus Christ. These people like unreasoning beasts, mere creatures of instinct, born only to be captured and destroyed, railing at things of which they are ignorant. I marvel at people that will accuse a ministry of something, and they don't even talk to them. Like, I forget that we was at the other place, and I got the note, and the guy said, I forget what he said. He was so, so gutless. I thought, I thought, you squirrel. God loves you, squirrel. He had to write me this note, and he didn't even have enough gut. Well, your name it, claim it, blah, blah, blah. I don't want the heck write a check. I love it. It's crazy. But they don't even know what they're talking about. And nobody wants to sit there and say, listen, I'm learning this. If I got an issue, instead of, well, I'm not going to say nothing. They might get, if they get mad, they got a problem. Amen? People tell me stuff all the time. God forbid. You know, if my fly's down, tell me. <laughs> How's can you to tell me my 
my fly was down. Because you get mad every time I tell you something. I felt this air coming in and then. But that's how we live. I'm not living that way anymore. Hallelujah. But these people, they're unreasoning beings railing up things which they are ignorant. They, they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. And in, and in their destroying, they shall surely be destroyed. So they operate like these. This is the mark of the beast. Now let me say this to you. I'm going to give you... I'm trying to think how many more. How many more I can give you? Let me give you... Uh, I want to give it to you. I can't. Uh, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, 18. I'll just give it to you. Most of you know this verse. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law... Happy is he. Now, that's not the greatest of translations. Where there is no revelation, many translations say, where there's no, the people cast off restraint. But he that keepeth the law, he that understands the new covenant, planet, new covenant, happy is he. Now, let me say this to you. Where there's no clear understanding of the new covenant, people cast off restraint. When you're operating on a mixture of old and new, people cast off restraint. I heard a saying that I thought was so good. See, we think of this as just personal vision. Let me tell you something about personal vision. My personal vision is swallowed up in who he is. Amen? It's not about me being ever anything. It's about him being everything. See, we make, well, I'm, i got to have a vision. i got to get a call from God. Even your calling is his calling. Hallelujah. But I heard this saying, it blessed my socks off. You want the way to kill a man with a vision. Are you ready for this? Give him two. Think about that. Now, let's apply it to the new covenant. Are you hearing me? The way to kill the life of the new covenant is to give you a mixture of old and new. There's two cities. There's two mountains. There's mixtures. Here it is. It's two covenants. That's what happens. And this is why people, the Bible says, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. So the way to kill a man with it, that's seeing the new covenant is just start mixing it with law and grace. Just start telling him, if you give, God will give to you. God's already gave everything to you. All oh, glory. Even the very fact that people hear this, well, now I don't have to give, reveals they don't understand the new covenant. When you realize that God is already giving everything to you, everything. Ah, should I do it? How about the ones that want to stay? <laughs> I've been told that there's people that want to stay and hear these things. I love the book of Revelation. I'm in love with it. Massively in love with it. Started reading it shortly thereafter. I got saved in December of 1984. Started reading it shortly thereafter. Because it says, blessed is he that reads and hears and understands and keeps those things that are written there. And for the time is at hand, literally the problem of time is in your hand. So that's why I started reading it. My mama didn't raise no fool. I believe in blessing, amen? Every month I read it. Every month. Diligently. Is it off? Oh, it's coming under. That's a new style. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a couple things. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord showed me what I call the puzzle principle. You get the two end, end books. We've done it in Revelation chapter 1. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's in signs and symbols. We know that. We went many places. In the book of Revelation, you get to the end. The spirit and the bride say come. With that said, go to Revelation chapter 20. We've got some wonderful stuff here today. Oh, you can't hear me? Okay. My wife fixed him. I'll just use a hand mic. The problem is not in your step. Okay, that's all right. Okay, where's the hand mic? Where's it? All right, there we go. Oh, I don't think it's on, but I'll hold it up and pretend it's on. Now, Revelation chapter 20, quickly, quickly. we got 45 minutes and then I'll be done. Revelation chapter 20. Now, let's go to verse 4. I, I want to say things about this. I'm just after something. I'm really after verse 8. Ah, uh, should I do it? Okay. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, had, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, his facade, neither received his mark upon their foreheads in the way they think, or in their hands, and what they do, and they lived in grain with Christ a thousand years. That's it. After a thousand years, you're done. <laughs> And, and I'll tell you what, if you, if you haven't been beheaded, only those that are beheaded. Oh, glory. So after service, we're going to have the guillotine up here. <laughs> I'm 
I'm telling you, we need to think some of this stuff through because it's insanity. Amen. I have watched these movies, you know, end time this and that and all those other things. And I'm telling you, we need to think this through and see how it applies now. Here's what he's talking I'll just give you quickly like, what he's talking about. The beheading, you know what beheading is in the Greek? Are you ready? I looked it up. It's powerful. Those that are beheaded with an axe. It's a specific beheading. Where's that at in scripture? The axe is laid to the root of the tree. See, it's a, it has to do with the beheading. In other words, your way is gone. And you're holding fast to the head, Colossians chapter 2. <laughs> Moving right along. Well, what about the thousand years? A thousand in scripture is a number of eternity. It's, in, it's an infinite number. And I've used this before you. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 50, verse 10, that God owns the cattle on how many hills? A thousand hills. That does not mean when you get to the thousand and first hill, God doesn't own that cow. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. Better is one day in your courts, it says, I believe in Psalm 84. Verse 10 around there somewhere. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand any elsewhere. Yeah, but once you get past a thousand, a thousand one, it's better elsewhere. It's better in the bar or something. <laughs> That's ludicrous. It's insanity. I struggle with religious insanity. I fought that stuff for years in my thinking, and I could never see it in the Word. And I say, Lord, I'm in the Word. Why can't I see this? They keep telling me it's this way. It doesn't fit into the charts. That's because it's about Jesus, not about the charts. Amen. Next verse. I'm not going to spend, I'm going to go fast. I'm really after some. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. That word there for finished has to do with they were completed. This is the first resurrection. Next verse says, blessed is and holy is he that hath part of the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Whoa, 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 whoa. I may have to stop. <laughs> but the first, what is the first resurrection? Well, what is the second death? Boy, it's quiet here. You got, we got to think about these things. Okay, the second death. Let's start with that. This is, um, I should have never started this. I'm sorry. The second, because <laughs> it's going to take longer than I can do. The second death is based upon the first death. Go to Genesis 2.17. Watch this. And we'll come right back here to the sixth verse of Revelation 20. Watch this. Second death. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this is God instructing Adam and Eve, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. In the Hebrew, it means that dying spiritually, you'll die physically. So the first death is what? Spiritual. Okay? The first death is spiritual. Now go back to Revelation 20, verse 6. I'm talking fast. I apologize. I shouldn't have done this, but some of you are glad I did, and I am too. All right. Blessed is holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. What is the first resurrection? What was the first death? He has part in the first resurrection. He's partaking of the life in the spirit of God that he's already got. Mm. Blessed and holy. That's me. That's you if you're hearing. Blessed and holy is he that is experiencing the, the, the spiritual blessings that are in Christ Jesus. He's taking part in this life. This resurrection in the spirit. I can hear it real good. On such the second death. What is the second death? Is that just physical? That's all the miseries arising from the first death. All the miseries of being separated from God. On such depression, sickness, have no power. Misery has no power. Bad relationships have no power. The second death is all the results of the first death. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Woo! I'm having a good time. Is this too deep? I fight to not go here. <laughs> Believe me. I can see, I see this stuff so clearly. I come in and say, my word, Jen, I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask me something. <laughs> Just ask me something. You know what that is? That's the Holy Ghost making me feel like that. Because he knows everything. But see, you can't see this stuff if you think, well, that, we won't even be here anyhow. On <laughs> such a second end, no power, they shall be priests of God. They'll be ministers, the Amplified Bible says. They'll be able to minister because they're new covenant ministers. But watch this. They're going to reign with Christ for oh, just a thousand years. Sorry. They're going to reign with Christ forever. It's infinite. Next verse. And when the thousand years are old, oh, expired. Go, go, give me from the Amplified, please. Now, if you got Satan bound, why would you let the guy out? <laughs> Anybody ever wonder that? I say if he, I'd say throw away 
away the key and leave him locked up. How many thousand years are completed? That's a better translation. What is that saying? When Jesus has finished the work. But now notice this. Then Satan's released. He was completely whipped at the cross from his place of confinement. We'll go to verse 8 from the Amplified. Or the King James, I'm sorry. Watch this. You know why he's released? Because at, and why he has to go out and deceive? Because after the work was completed through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has no power to whip anybody. He can only deceive now. Mm -hmm. That's why he has to go out and deceive the nations. The nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Watch these definitions for Gog and Magog. This will rock your world. If I can find it. Here it is. You know what? What? Oh, no, Chris, that's, that's China, isn't it? Isn't that Russia? Uh, isn't it? It's none of those. Here's what it means. He goes out to deceive. The word for Gog means to cover. It means, ready for this? It means to surmount or top. Magog means overtopping or covering. That's why he goes out and deceives. Those who are covered up, they can't see. Oh, glory. It's a veil of the old covenant. They think it's religion. Most people in the world, you ask them, well, are you a Christian? Well, I haven't really been going to church like I used. I didn't ask you that. I said, are you born again? How many people say that? You know why? Because they relate being a Christian to what they do rather than to what he did. Amen. That's why they talk like that. I get a kick out of it. I've been around people, you know, you know what I'm talking about? And all of a sudden, they'll be like cussing and stuff. And then I remember seeing them go like this. There's a preacher in there. It's a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> My child, what was that filthy garbage? Can we get a go? Like you don't live in the real world. <laughs> that's powerful. Again, I'm gonna, I could go into how they battle the holy city that's descending down from above. I could go into all that. We're not going there. But I just want to give you a little bit of it. Gog and Magog have to do with the covering. And see, the beheading has to do with an axe. Jesus said, in 2 Kings, it talks about an axe head swimming. Jesus came up out of that same river, the Jordan River. Remember that? And then in Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, in Matthew chapter, or Luke chapter 3, verse 9, it talks about now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen. Amen. See, that's the beheading. And then when you are beheaded, guess what you do? You can hold fast to another head. Go to Colossians chapter 2. We're just about done. Colossians chapter 2, and I'll just go with about verse 16. If you can't get it up, that's okay. I think it's about verse 18. It talks about, there it is. Let no man therefore judge you, meet or and drink in respect of the new moon or the holy days or the Sabbath days added. Next verse. Which are a shadow of things to come. They were a shadow back then of the things that were to come, which have come now. But the body is of Christ. Next verse. Let no man beguile you of your reward in, a human, uh, reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels and truth to those things which he has not seen any puff up by his flesh. You might not go fast. I might do this in tongues, so you'll have to interpret. Next verse. <laughs> Next verse. And now here's what I'm after. And not holding the head. Can I have this from the Amplified? Not hold, watch this, and not holding fast to the head. Who is the head? Thank you very much, Jesus. But it's hard to hold to the head when you haven't been beheaded with the axe that's been laid to the root of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can you hear this? Isn't it good? Oh, glory to God! I've been afraid to share truth and the fear's gone! You know why? Because it puts you in contact. Oh, that guy doesn't believe in the rapture. I believe in the rapture. I'm being raptured right now. Amen. Why do we debate about stuff we don't even know about? <laughs> That's why people don't read the book of Revelation. Let's just be honest. You know why? Because it doesn't matter anyhow because I won't be here. Why should I waste my time? Yes, you heard me right. Reading a book that doesn't even apply to my life now. A masterstroke of religious deception. Masterstroke. You know, I'll go back to what I started with. The enemy doesn't care if you relegate everything to the past or to the future. Do you know that if you study history, there were two monks that were hired by the Church of Rome to teach two doctrines. One of them said that all the things took place in the past. Preterist. Another doctrine said everything is going to take place in the future. Futurist. And that guy's name was Francisco Rivera. I forget what the other guy's name was in the past. 
And, and the whole goal, hear me, was to get the emphasis off of the Church of Rome who was persecuting, killing, torturing the Inquisition, all these believers who were not part of the Roman Church. They, they created those doctors to get the emphasis off of the church. Glory. Glory to God. Let's hold fast to the head. Holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, I love this, supplied. <laughs> Are you supplied? Are you fully supplied? And knit together by means of its joints and ligaments, grows, grows with a growth, a true growth that is from God. You're blessed. Amen. You're highly favored. Amen. Let me just speak blessing over you. I thank you that we are blessed. That we are holding fast to the head. That we are partakers of the first resurrection. The second death has no power in my life. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Now